Okay, so let's sum up now. As you might have begun to suspect, the actual plan of God for every believer's life is to become a mini Jesus Christ. The salvation he executed on the cross was brought about as a result of a certain, what do you want to say, structure and plan of creating spiritual growth in him. And as Hebrews 12, 2 says in a bunch of other places, Ephesians 3, 1, uh, 3, 15 through 19, um, especially that, the height, the width, depth, breadth, verse that's just after that or in it. I think it's in it. And that's played on in reverse by 1 John 1, 4, 12 through 16. That was a big shocker when I found that out. John is doing the same thing as Paul, but he's playing on it in reverse order. John plays on Paul a lot. And the theologians don't seem to understand that. It's really amazing. Um... At least I can't find anything on anybody recognizing that John is playing on Paul so often. God is out to, to clone his son in us. And John keeps talking about that in 1 John. See, in order to have fellowship with someone, you got to have shared thinking in common. And John just flat says, at the end of 1 John 2... You can look it up even in translation. It's not so far off. That we will see him as he is because we're going to be like him. And Paul is basically saying the same thing when he's talking about the mirror. And, you know, the temporary will pass away at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. Um, the idea, and that's also Ephesians 3, 15 through 19. And Galatians 4, he just threw that at me, especially 4, 19. I'm at pains, I'm in labor pains, literally, until Christ is born in you. That's not being born again. That's his thinking being born in you. And of course, Christ in you, the confidence of glory, he just threw at me. That's Colossians 1, 25 through 27. And, uh, you know, he's throwing a lot of verses here. So just ask him for more verses, because he'll throw them at you if he's throwing them at me. Okay. So each one of us, by the design and plan and role and purpose of God, is designed to become a mini-Christ. And whether we actually do it or not, we're used that way in this life. The world needs us to go on living. It hates us, just as it hated him. Christ warned the apostles of that. And just as he talked about it in John 17 also, but the whole book of John is about this from John 14 onward. The world will hate us even as it hated him. Because we have the same role. Now when I say we have the same role, it is a saving role. It is a messianic role. But what we're being used to save, and I mean used, we're instruments. Okay, well, we're being used to save solely by means of the Holy Spirit growing us inside our heads. Not through what we do. The kind of saving that we're doing is saving the world time, buying them time. Saving the world angst and trouble because the evil in this world is somewhat depressed. That's the theme of 1 Thessalonians that he just threw at me, you know, where it says that, you know, the evil one hasn't come yet until the Holy Spirit is taken away, and it's a bad translation there, um, where it's talking about the, the evil, you know, until it is taken away, it's in the King James, it says it, but it means he, the Holy Spirit, um, and I'm sure the translators understood that. The Holy Spirit's in the world because we're in the world. When church is removed at the rapture, that's why the trip is as bad as it is. Because all of the protection that is given the world through the Christians in it are removed. It's a diplomatic recall. 
The dip a diplomat is recalled, and you can check this anywhere in international law. A diplomat is recalled either because the diplomat is bad or because the host country has declared war against the home country of the diplomat. And basically both of those things come to a head, which culminates in the rapture. And the last person who would ever believe in Christ under the church covenant believes, and there's no more growth. So home you go. Okay, Satan's going to think that church has failed to grow. And God's going to say it's the way God wanted it and the church is finished. So there's this big argument about whether God's cheating and Satan really won or not. And that's why you see all that, Revel you know, Revelation 12, you know, mid-tribulation, the big war in heaven stuff. And then Satan comes down to the earth. That's basically why. Because Satan's maintaining that, that God's cheating, that the so-called completion of church was actually Satan defeated God and God won't admit it. Okay, so then Satan, you know, just tries to force his way. And doesn't, it, that doesn't work. Okay, but the point is, is that meanwhile, the world is going on one more day because we're on it. We're the salt of the earth. You've heard that many times. But now you have a much clearer sense of what it is. You're here to learn Christ. You're here to become a clone of Christ. Because that's what's going on, the world is being given more time to live. It doesn't want God. If you don't want God, you don't get God. The Christians who are apostate, it's kind of like the hell analogy. One more day, fertilize the fig tree one more time. Maybe they'll change their mind tomorrow, even though God knows they won't. They still can. And they'll grow. But when the balloon goes up, that's the end of the time and the chances to grow. Now, it's not that there's no growth that happens post-death. It's more like the bank account of Bible doctrine you take with you is going to be of a certain size, depending on how well you learned and lived on Bible down here. If you learned and lived on it a whole lot to where you got to spiritual maturity, then you're awarded a kingdom because inside your head you're king-sized like Christ. So what's really happening and this is the part I have so much trouble with, as you probably know by now. Is that the thoughts that are building in me and you are designed to make our souls king size. Greek verb is oxano. It means to grow. It's usually translated magnified or enlarged, just a more common translation. To make your soul big enough so that your soul is king sized, and basically the kingdom you inherit is the product of your soul. Even as, Hebrews 12, 2, Christ is our archegos, the founder, progenitor, leader of everybody. In other words, we're being crafted from his soul. His soul had to be crafted first. That's hupogramas, that's in Peter. It's usually translated copybook in King James English, and that's not too bad. It's a wax tablet where you copy the letters. Romans kids had little wax tablets that they copy letters, and so it's called a copy book in English. And the Greek word is hupogramos. We are being copied. Christ is being copied into us. We are therefore. He had to come first. That's why the old T the Old Testament people didn't get this. He had to come first, finish first as a human being, so he'd have a soul that could be copied. You've got to have an original, an originator, in order to have a copy. And this is a soul copy. Well, until he takes on humanity, there's no soul. This is why the Old Testament people got shadows. That's Hebrews 10. Okay? So he's got a soul. He had to, his soul and soul had to be built down here. In order for him to become the archaeos, that's a Greek word that's usually translated author and finisher in Hebrews 12 too. And as a result of him finishing at the cross, 
his growth maxed out at the cross. Because the one thing he didn't know was sin. Okay, God imputed all the sin to him that maxed out the size of his soul and I can't even imagine the pain. And that's how he, in his human nature, achieved oneness with God. He was already one with God in his deity, but his deity and his humanity, even though in the same person, they weren't fully united. I mean, they were, fun, they were what do you want to call it? Your body, okay, here's the analogy. Your arms are attached to your body. Your legs are attached to your body. So they're all united in, in that sense, physically. But your skill in using your arms and legs requires a great deal of practice and training so that your body is operating in unison or at the command of your, your brain, which is to say your soul. So the unity between deity and humanity, the connections between the two, were there as a, as a structure, as it were physically. Physical is not really the right word, but I don't have a better one. But the operation, the unity of operation, couldn't occur until after the cross, because there always had to be, he always had to withhold himself from looking into his deity, for example, to learn something. He had to rely on the Holy Spirit instead. So all the coordination was run by the Holy Spirit until he finished the cross. At that point, his whole, his whole deity and his whole human nature totally linked up and functioned together, same between his human nature and Father. The oneness that he's talking about in John 17. Always had it as God, but didn't always have it as human. Because a human being's got to learn. Which means training and training and training. And over and over and boring and unrelated. And why am I practicing scales on the piano? And one of the most important things you can do if you want to play piano well. Is practice scales till you drop. Because it gives you a fluency in your fingers and mind control on your fingers. If you can do the scales between your mind and your fingers then it becomes much easier once you learn how to read music to tell your fingers what to do. It's a fluency between mind and body. A fluency between human nature and divine nature. And it's the human nature that has to learn it. Divine nature already knows. So, as a result, his soul became so much larger that is, as it were, the prototype in the sum of all souls okay but the kings are bigger than the rest of the souls and what God builds into the king souls is going to get replicated this is the part I have so much trouble with it's going to get replicated in the souls of the members of your kingdom you're a king and everybody in your kingdom is like a kid and their soul is going to be kitted out to conform to yours and they're going to grow based on yours it's the same exact analogy as what is explained in Ephesians 4.16. Except there, it's the difference between the pastor and the congregation. The pastor is a certain growth level that is above your own. Okay? Not all pastors are superior to all believers. But the congregation of a pastor that belongs to that pastor is below him. So that's why a pastor can even be apostate and God will still have a place for him in the kingdom. Because no matter how apostate, every pastor gets something right. And there's always a flock that is below that pastor that could benefit from being under him. And God knows how to match everybody up. That's what Ephesians 4.16 is basically saying. When it says joint of supply, that's actually a sexual verb for the wedding night. And Paul's drawing an analogy between the oneness between a man and woman on their wedding night and the oneness that God has designed spiritually for us to achieve through being groomed, as it were, by being under our right teachers. That's why I keep on harping on you got to find your right pastor. And to all those people who think there's no such thing as the right pastor doctrine, I feel sorry for them. 
because they clearly can't read the Greek. Because the Greek is unmistakable. Paul is using two marriage verbs that relate to the sex act between the man and the woman uniting on their wedding night. And even Thayer's diction, the lexicon is pretty bald about that. All right, I mean, it, Theo doesn't mince words when necessary. The other lexicons try to glaze over what that really means. Okay, so the proper translation said joint of supply should be husbandman, with all the, the variation and meaning and the semantic range that the English uses. That's what you are going to be to your kingdom if you're king the same idea. The king is always the chief standard bearer. The king lives the standard. Everybody's inspired by watching the king live the standard and they want to ape it and of course they can't because they don't they don't have the perspective that the king does. They're not trained like the king. They're not as mature in the standard as the king is. But they get farther than they would be on their own because there is a king to watch and emulate. And the king is always on public view. The king is always on display. And that's true for any of the royal families down here, too. It's the same idea. The chief job of, the, of a royal family is to teach standards. Ideally, good ones. And the people look up at king or queen, and they love doing that. And they try to be better. They're inspired. They're doing it of their own volition. There's no law. There's no legislation. Telling them that they must obey. They're so inspired by what they consider to be the beauty, the virtue in the king and the queen. That they themselves aim higher. Aim at a higher lifestyle. Aim at a higher virtuous standard. And since all these Christians down here are not learning and living on Bible, the few who become kings become the standard bearers, and they have been cloned into Christ completely. The rest of us will be like him, but not fully, because we didn't learn Bible down here. We'll be structurally like him. But what about the thought pattern? It didn't develop. Okay, but is is there no hope? Well, of course there's hope. But you're entering heaven with a very small bank account. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. You are saved and that's it. There's nothing on top of that. That's how most Christians are. So their heavenly bank account of understanding Christ is that of a baby. So it, they're not going to really start even understanding him until they're dead. Until we're in the eternal state. Or, you know, until they're dead at least. I'm sure that the people in heaven now are learning. I mean, how can you not learn if you're seeing God? So, the bank account, the heavenly bank account you enter heaven with, depends on how well you learned and lived on Bible down here. Which in turn depends on how much you use when John 1, 9 got under your right pastor are sitting under that pastor learning and living on doctrine, talking to God, and optionally talking to other believers to try and learn Bible better, practice what you know. That's God's system. So how much were you in God's system down here? How far did you go? That's the only way that anybody matures. And most Christians aren't even in God's system. So they enter heaven, as, as Paul explains, it talk us naked. Nothing to show for it. All their works are burnt up. 1 Corinthians 3. And Peter talks about that in 2 Peter 3 also. And in fact, he even ends up using the great, great Greek word, huparkain, which means really to be self-ruled. It, it, it has a the structure of the actual word. To the combination of the two terms. Who pair means under and RK means first or pr primary or ruling. So you're under, you're under your own ruling. It's a really clever word. 
Peter says in Second Peter three eleven, what sort of persons must we become in a dedicated to God lifestyle? Because the world's going to be burnt up with all of its works. That was what he had said in the preceding. So the dedicated to God lifestyle that you live down here eventuates if you stick with it into you becoming a king and basically just as Christ is the copy book from whom you became who you become your kingdom is gonna you're the copy book for your kingdom so it's all important and please remind me of this too because I don't remember it as often as I should it's all important how you spend each minute in your thinking because what's happening to you is the same thing that happened to Christ. Line on line, precept on precept, moment on moment. He's learning and living on Bible so his soul will get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. Because he's training for the cross. Okay, but all the cross does is birth more crosses. It's a constant bearing. It's a constant child bearing. That's the actual word that's being used. In... um. Isaiah 53:11, may mal nafsho, through the labor, and it means pregnancy labor of his soul, he makes righteous. Padato yatstik, through knowledge. So through your knowledge, you're going to be bearing kids forever, and that's the other part of it. I have so much trouble with. I have trouble with being a public person. I have trouble with the kingship thing. I have trouble with the parenting thing. I have trouble thinking of myself as being over others. Well, too bad. That's my spiritual hickey. Hopefully it's not yours. Okay? But this is the deal. Christ is being cloned down here in aggregate and individually into those who are going to keep on staying with it and become kings and you stay with it by staying in God's system. Every time you fall down you use one child one nine. It's not about whether you sin, it's not about what kinds of sins you sin, it's not even about how often you sin. It's about whether you use one John one nine, you get up again, you learn and live on Bible. Because one of the devil's biggest tricks is to make you focus on how bad you are, how inferior you are, what sins you sinned in the past. So that you obsess about yourself rather than Aistobraveon, which is, uh, uh, he just threw that at me. Um, what is that? Uh, Philippians 3.14. Looking at the goal. Forget what's behind. You look at the goal. Braveon means goal. Okay? So you're supposed to keep looking at the goal, and the enemy's going to keep making you taught tempting you to focus on yourself and how you compare to your own idea of yourself and if that doesn't work well enough he'll bring in other people to to make sure that whatever it is you did wrong in the past is constantly in your face that your inadequacies are constantly in your face and you're going to have a lot of them and you're going to have a lot of failures that are going to be really upsetting to you and you have to forget them Paul was the worst sinner who ever lived. You're not Paul. Paul had to forget it. That's Philippians 3.14. So you see, you know, the world thinks that it's holy if you feel bad about your sin. Have a guilt complex. That you moan and suffer. Oh, I was a bad person. I don't care if you're an ex murderer, honey. You're not doing God or anybody any good if you focus on the past. It's done. You can't turn back time. All you can do is make the most of the time. Colossians 4 5, I just threw that into my mind. And I want to say it's Ephesians 4 6, 5 6 in the King James Version that's translated redeeming the time. And that's exactly what's going on. So whatever went wrong in the past, honey, it's over. Just like I explained in the last increment. Every single one of us has the genes of somebody bad in us. Somebody who committed really heinous crimes. And yet God let that person live and we, we would not exist if that person didn't exist. Because we're a product of past genes. And if God was to eliminate everybody who did something wrong, 
Oh, honey, you know what? You and I wouldn't be here. And we're not exactly right either. So God's making good on the past. So you don't worry about it. It's I still rub in. Look at the goal. God is cloning his son into you. Do you want that? And if the answer is yes, hi, here's your future. You're going to be a king. Christ is being copied into your soul. One yes at a time, one precept at a time. It's very low, it's very slow. Doesn't look like what's actually happening. Has absolutely no connection to the world around you. It's two, You're living in two universes at the same time. This universe, which is dead to God. And God's universe, which is alive only through your human spirit. Through what the Holy Spirit teaches you. It's the only way you know. And it's the only way you grow. And he can use washing the dishes to produce the greatest divine work of all time. I mean, again, think about the cross. All that happened was he hung there. All that happened was, Father, he stabbed him with our sins. Javelin stabs. Isaiah 53, 5. That's all that happened. Okay, so if him stabbing Christ... And he just says, okay, well, now you, now sins are paid. I stab my son, so therefore sins are paid. That's basically how it works. It's totally arbitrary. Okay, so he can, I can be doing the dishes and he can pronounce anything he wants as to what that means. Brown's thinking Bible while she washes the dishes, therefore um, I, I'll give Houston a billion dollars. I don't know what he chooses, but it's up to him to choose. He's the one who sees it. Same thing about what he makes out of you as a king and what he makes out of your kingdom from you as a progenitor. King, progenitor, front page news every day. Everybody's really happy to see you as a king. It inspires them. And they will learn what they didn't learn down here. And they learn it through you and they become copies of you. And that makes good on all the past. Because God says so. You begin to appreciate Satan's upset with all this stuff. So much of this is God just flat says so. I and mean, we've heard the Calvinists say this for years and they're right to say it, but they don't even understand what it is. God just flat says you're saved. And he says it because he stabbed his son son didn't actually do anything. He just said yes. Holy Spirit held them together. So who's doing the work there? Okay, well, what work's getting done here? None. And that's the point that Satan doesn't understand. God says, this is how I want it to go. I will be baptizing all these moments with these meanings because I just flat feel like doing it this way. Do you want it or not? Yes, no. If you ask, it's a constant thought monitoring day in, day out, like practicing scales on the piano. There's no glamour to it. Walo Khadar. Walo Khadar is uh, Isaiah 53 2. There's no glory in him that we'll see. Lo, Toa, Lo, he's not the incarnation. Not him. Well, oh, Father, and there's no, nothing, there's no glory there. There's nothing desirable. Well, Nachma Dehu, that we desire. There's no glory down here. And that's why it works. Here you are, Christ in you, the confidence of glory. Confidence is Greek word elpis. It means confident expectation of a thing you can't see. And that's Colossians one twenty five to twenty seven again. And yeah, you can't see it all right. You're doing the dishes. Where's the glory in that? Well Hadar, baby. There's no glory there. Yeah, but God just flat decrees that this boring thing of doing the dishes is gonna have X value and that's because he likes it that way. Meanwhile, all your apostate Christian friends 
are running around giving the poor, patting themselves on the back, inventing all kinds of legalistic rules, telling everybody to go to hell if you commit suicide, saying that you have to repent of sins to be saved, and they're, therefore they're saving no one and they're totally carnal. But they sure feel good and they sure seem to be doing something. Yeah, Christ wasn't actually doing anything on the cross either. And then he ends up being crowned. So will you. And then all those people who laughed at you when you were down here are probably going to be in your kingdom. They're going to be singing a very different tune then. They're going to be laughing with gratitude at how stupid they are. And laughing with gratitude that you actually won and they lost. They'll be glad of that. And they'll be hanging on everything you say. Because everything you say is going to help them see Christ better. Because they didn't want to see him down here. So they aren't going to see him except through you up there. That just wanks me out. But you see how logical it is? And that's the Atsumim Clause in Isaiah 50 through 12. He will share out the booty. The Chalik Shalal. He will share out the booty, the people booty, Le Rabim, with the great ones, Atsumim. And the great ones are the kings. I mean, it's not just the kings in church. That, that verse is encompassing the Old Testament greats, too. They each get their own cities, states. That's a different portion for them. But we have ours, our kingdoms, too. I don't know how large the kingdoms are going to be. I assume that they're going to be varied in size. But the essential part is that the king is the copybook for his kingdom. Even as the pastor is the copy book for his students down here. Same idea. So you're going to be this walking, talking, living standard of Christ. And everybody's going to ooh and ah about how much better you are than them. And they'll be really thrilled about it. And they'll be copying you. And that's how it goes on forever. And all you're going to care about is how much they learn him. Because all you're going to care about is the happiness that they get from knowing him better tomorrow than they do today. That will thrill you more than anything. And they'll know that. There's not going to be this, you know, hi, I'm better than you, learning it over and all that stuff. The pomp and circumstance is going to be there because the hoi polloi need it. People need a good show. They need a good parade. They learn from that. It's the highlight of their dull, dreary lives. So you're going to have to have the jewels. You're going to have to have the money, the palaces, you know, the gold rim plates or whatever is the standard of wealth up there then. Because the people need it. You won't care. But it, it serves to teach. Even as ritual serves to teach. And there'll be a lot of it. I don't like that part of it either. But people need that. They prefer it. This is what they choose to use to learn. Witness the popularity of ritual religion down here all these thousands of years. So, human nature is still human nature. It's just sinless in the eternal state. Okay, well that's a vital component of human nature. People like the pomp and circumstance. They like the parade, they like to see the glitz, they learn from it, it, it pleases them. Okay, well, they're learning like kids do, but 24 hours pass, and what your kingdom knows about him 24 hours later is higher than 24 hours earlier. And so does it matter what props you have to have in order for them to figure out extra little dots of learning because they have no spiritual bank accounts when they get to heaven you're going to be spending the wealth of your kingdom on them and they're going to be spending the wealth of whatever they got and all their efforts and thoughts on you 
So it's just like a marriage, husband and wife. The oneness Christ talked about, that's what happens in a dynamic, in a society where everybody wants to give to everybody else because it's a thrill to do that. It's tasty. Practicing righteousness will finally become something everybody enjoys doing forever. So that's why I suspect heaven's going to have a lot of work in it. I mean work like what people think of as work. But I mean everybody's going to be pouring himself out. I don't think it's going to be like you just snap your fingers for your cup of coffee in the morning. I think people are going to want the old-fashioned way. So that they can, you know, go through the process. Because God's going through the process right now. He can snap his fingers and have everything be perfect, but you notice he doesn't like that. But we'd not be the way we are. So he must like it the hard way. So if he likes it the hard way and he likes it now, what do you think eternity's going to be like? Everybody huffing and puffing and, and enjoying it. And really, honestly speaking, when you really enjoy what you're doing, you enjoy the effort it takes too. If you don't much enjoy what you're doing, once you have to go through too much effort, you don't like it anymore. So that's how the eternal state is, and that's how where you're going with it. And that makes good on all the past and all the future. But it's doing it precept on precept, line on line, in your head. Because you take your soul to heaven. Your soul goes to heaven. Your body goes into the ground. 1 Corinthians 15. Spiritual capital. King sized. Is being built in your head down here. So then you get all the other material trappings to go with it. Including the people. Because the kingdom you will own. Even as Christ owns us. So that's basically, if, if you need a big grand plan, you've seen now the grand strategy, which is really the process, which is really practicing righteousness. You see that it's a war for independence, which is actually an independence from being human. Because Christ had to become one with his deity. And we have to become one with God, so we have to become beyond human even while we remain human. Closest thing to a hypostatic union that, that we can experience. So we are actually living the life of Christ. This is what happened to him. The scope was bigger. The perils were higher. He couldn't even sin once. But it's the same mechanism. It's the same setup. It's the same structure. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, so we get filled with the Holy Spirit. He was indwelt by the Holy Spirit, so we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament people didn't have this. They had cookie-cutter rules they had to obey. Romans 13 and 14 and 15 says, uh-uh, we make the rules, and we stand or fall before God based on how well we made the rules. Here you're given this Bible, you're given your mentor, that's a Greek term, it means teacher, and it's actually the name of the guy who taught Telemachus, who was the son of Odysseus. I think it was Odysseus. In other words, mentor means a trainer of a king. Telemachus was the son of a king. The mentor is the Holy Spirit, that's John 14. So you've got God as your mentor. Old, T Old Testament people didn't have that. They had angels. They had intermediaries. You get God directly teaching you and dwelling you and filling you. That's pleroma. That's pleuro is the Greek verb. And it's very different from the Old Testament filling, which was pimplemi. And pimplemi was used to signify the eating of a meal and your stomach is full. So obviously it's much more limited because it's got this physical physicality to it. You, you don't have that. It's all invisible. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. It's royally invisible. So you're learning the way Christ learned. You have all the same assets. You have the same game plan. You have the same structure. But your cross is not a cross to pay for the sins of the human race. 
your cross is to become a copy book for your portion of the human race eventually and meanwhile to buy time for the entire human race or your portion of the human race down here. And what are you actually doing with your body? Probably nothing or something menial. 99% of a person's day is menial. It takes hours and hours and hours just to wake up and get dressed and go to work. It takes hours and hours and hours just to go to the store, figure out what you're buying at the store, come home from the store, and of course you have to take care of your car in order to do that, stick the groceries in the refrigerator and all the other places you stick it, and then you got to do the dishes, and you got to make the food, and then you got to clean the dishes, and you got to put away the dishes, and you got to go to the store again, and then you got to repeat the whole thing again, at least once a day. And, you know, if you're not doing that, you're shining your shoes, or ironing your clothes for the next day's work, or filing your bills, or paying your bills, or going on the internet to figure out how to pay your bills. Or depositing checks. I mean, come on. Our lives are run by the mundane. And that's what you do with your body, but that doesn't have to be what you do with your soul. And the real game is what are you doing with your soul, no matter what you're doing with your body. Are you using one John 1 9? Fine, then anything you're doing with your body between sins is divine good because the actual divine good is what the Holy Spirit's doing to you while you do whatever it is you do with your body, whether you're going to the bathroom or the boardroom. And you can't see or touch or taste or feel or even know what he's doing to you. Because it's spiritual, not physical. And so, when you start to think about yourself, and I st said this before in episode 8, so I'm sort of looping back to it now, to try to close the point here about arbitrary and the war of independence and tie all this back, you have to think of yourself, like I said before, as an entity. You are a person in training. You are a royal person in training. You are a crown prince or princess in training. There's only one gender in heaven, but we'll say prince or princess for the sake of argument. That's what you are. Down here. Every single moment your job is to learn and live on Bible. What is God's will? Am I sinning? Am I just being tempted? How do I understand this Bible passage? How do I apply the Bible to my email? My brushing my hair? Whatever. Very, very analytical. Very wearing on the soul. Very tiring. But that's how a royal even has to live down here in secular life. And it's much higher standard of what you what you have to be thinking because God's hearing every thought in the spiritual life. But there's a great analogy to the, to the secular life for royalty. They have to be careful about everything they think and do. They do not belong to themselves, neither do you. You belong to your future kingdom. You are a public person, you're on divine television, God's seeing you, the elect angels are cheering you on, the demons are booing you, and if your relatives happen to be watching, well, you know, they're going to have their own opinions too, but they don't have a sin nature anymore. So they're all going to want you to grow. But the person you really want to focus on the fact is God who hears. And there's no point in freaking out about it because God's always known you since eternity past. So what the heck does it matter if anybody else is listening in? Not at all. And you're preparing. You are a public person. So you might as well know right now you're in your own movie. You're in your own stadium. You don't belong to yourself. The whole bunch of beings who want you to fail. Which means not using one John one night. Not learning and living on Bible. Getting all discouraged about how inferior you are. 
But they don't actually regard you as inferior. Because you had a superior spiritual life they don't have. And if you complete it, you'll actually be ruling angels too. And now do you see why? Because your spiritual life, the mechanics, the structure, everything about it is just like Christ's. That's the whole purpose of 1 John. To explain that. That's what 1 John 4, 12 through 16 says. We are evidence in the trial. That's 1 John 4, 16. And he's playing back to what Paul says in Ephesians 3, 15 through 19. In opposite order. You know, the dimensions of the building of your soul. So that's what's going on. No matter what you see, what you feel, what you taste. And, you know, I mean, when I first saw it, I was never all that fond of of it. But there's one thing about that movie Matrix that makes a lot of sense. What life we think we're living down here isn't the real life. Okay. What we think is the beautiful or important or real. If the scales were off our eyes, we'd see how puny and small and tawdry and ugly our lives are. And we'd scream. And we'd see that the real game is going on inside the head. But you don't battle like they battled in the movie Matrix. It's a head game. That's Ephesians 5 and 6. You're battling with yourself in the war of independence. Because you are not a private person. You do not belong to yourself. You are not a product solely of your own choosing. But your choosing is pivotal to the outcome of what you'll become. Even though... You have no power, there's no merit in your choosing. But God isn't going to do a thing to you that you don't say yes to. Because he just doesn't, he doesn't go against volition. So every moment you got one thing you can do, you can say yes. You fall down because you said no, you get up again, you say yes. I sobrevente, sano clesius tutti, un Cristo Jesu, Philippians 3.14. Foot on foot, front foot, front foot, foot in front of foot. Even though it seems like it's pointless, because it is pointless in the world's terms. But God's doing something with it that you can't see. So you're practicing righteousness then, just because. You're also practicing righteousness and then all the past is being summed up in you. And that's going to be a progenitor for the future, including your own kingdom. Because God wants it. That's his design. That's how he designed it for Christ. That's how he designs it for us. Because we're supposed to be one in Christ. Well, you can't be one in Christ if you don't have the same life you had. So now, hopefully... I'm, I'm not sure if I can close out episode 11. I'm going to try. Hopefully you see now the like big picture and how all the little daily stuff interrelates to it. So you got a big connected view of both the big side and the little side of what you do every day and how they connect and how invisible it is and yet how real. And all this, of course, is demonstrating to Satan the road not taken. What he could have if he changed his mind, which God knows he's not going to do. But that doesn't stop God from asking him. All demons are watching, and they're seeing us puny humans actually have more virtue than they had before they sinned. Because you know what? They had bigger abilities than we do. It was easier for them not to sin than it is for us. And they, they knew God better and yet not. 
because Christ went all the way down to humanity and became fully functional with his deity. So they're learning from us how everything works, the, the, the total connection between high and low is what they're learning. Because they start out higher than us, so they don't know about low. <clears throat> There's lots of stuff about low they don't know, they have to watch it. I'm not sure I understand altogether what that means, but the Bible says that's what they're doing. That's in Second Peter where the angels are, you know, longing to look. They're learning. So there's something in the growth that we get that they don't have. Which is, you know, only fair. Because if we're going to be ruling angels, we got to be made better than them. If we're going to be made better than them, then they're not going to mind us being better than them. They're going to enjoy it for a change. Because here they've been superior to us for so long, it'd be kind of nice to have somebody be superior to them that they can look up to. Especially after all the effort they went to to take care of us in the first place. It's only fair. So all this stuff is really mag... You know, it's like it's like epic. It's all really epic, but it plays really small. Because God isn't really using the stuff down here except as a juridical occasion to make us grow. Okay, I'm small, I'm puny, I'm nothing. Therefore, everything I do is going to be small and puny and nothing. Okay, so then what I do of myself isn't accomplishing anything. Okay, but because I'm small and puny and nothing, that creates a juridical issue. Hi, God's watching small, puny, nothing, brain out, breathe. Where is the justice... And God having to watch puny nothing brain out breathe. How does God make good on that for God's own sake? Oh. Well, see, brain out has to do the dishes. And dishes are even boring to brain out. How much more boring to God and how much more useless to God. So how can God baptize that moment? That brain out is doing the dishes... To make it worth his time to forever and eternity, past and future, have to watch me do the dishes because that moment never dies to him. See the juridical occasion? See how on the one hand it has absolutely nothing to do with the dishes because dishes, washing dishes might be moral but it has nothing to do with God. But what is the real moral issue there? God has to watch it? Satan's busy saying, well why do you why do you create the need for dishes to be washed in the first place? Why can't people just eat their food and the dishes just disappear? You see, Satan wants everything to be magic. God wants everything to be free. Okay, but it is still a justice issue. God is watching me do the dishes. What is he getting for that? So he's going to have to just flat declare whatever it is he should get for that. And it doesn't have anything to do with the dishes themselves. It does have to do with the fact that, hi, you're perfect God, you're infinite, you shouldn't have to watch this. So what kind of compensation should you get for that? Notice that it's not a sin to do the dishes. But there is a justice issue of compensation. When you sit in the doctor's office... <clears throat> and you end up having to wait an extra hour, it's not the sin of the doctor. Something happened with the other patients that he didn't know and you didn't know, and it took an extra hour. Okay, but you're going to think to yourself, gee, you know, how do I get paid for this? How do I make my time spent worthwhile? Because it's a valid justice issue. Okay, well, it's a valid justice issue to God. Why should I watch Brain Out do the dishes? Or whatever it is you're doing. I'm using myself because I don't know you. Well, God says, well, let's see. I think in order the justification for my watching Brain Out do the dishes forever and eternity past and future is X. So I'm going to baptize the doing of those dishes with X value. And God's basically rewarding himself 
because he really should for having to watch me do dishes. Now you multiply that by billions and billions and billions and billions of people every single moment of every single day and there's a whole bunch of baptizing juridical occasions for justice to rule on what should God do to reward himself for the hassle of having to watch it. So you see the works themselves do nothing but they do provide a juridical occasion even as our sins being imputed to Christ provide a juridical occasion for God to rule on what that would do. And what did he rule? Hi everybody who believes in my son is saved. That's what he considers compensation. It still baffles me why he does but you know what? He's God. It's his right to choose whatever he wants to choose and that's what he chose. So if that's what he chose for that, my sins, what else is he choosing for all the other banal things I do during the day? Same for you, same for everybody else on the planet, believe it or not. So what is this kingdom and this soul that he's building in each of us going to actually be worth? Well, it's going to have to be worth a lot. Why? Well, God's going to have to watch that soul forever. So what's he going to make us into? Christ. Because, hello, it was the thinking of Christ that God deemed paid for sins. Isaiah 53, 11, but that So then we're dividends of Christ if our thinking of Christ is building us. <clears throat> then he sees Christ everywhere he looks. If it pleased him on the cross, why wouldn't it please him now? See? So that's what's the game plan. And all you're doing functionally is every day practicing righteousness, learning and living on Bible, under your pastor, in God's system. Isn't that beautiful? It's simple. It's elegant. It's the theory of everything. And everybody in your kingdom is going to be really glad that you went through that. Because gonna, you're going to be the copy book for them. And that's where my spiritual problem is. But honey, maybe that's not yours. Peace out.